Well, good evening. I hope everybody has had a great Resurrection Sunday today with your families. Um, even though we've not been able to meet as a church, um, I pray that you all have had a wonderful day today celebrating the fact that we serve a living Savior. He is alive, and I just hope that you all have had a great day today. Tonight, I want to uh, talk about one of the most important questions in our life. One of the most important questions in life that we can ask. Now, depending on your age, depending on where you're at, what phase of life you're in, that question may be different, that most important question. When that comes up, you might think of something else. Uh, when you were in elementary school, your most important questions about life may have been, where are my toys and what's for lunch? Middle school, your most important questions in life may have been, who are my friends? What's for dinner? High school, maybe your most important questions might be that, uh, who do I like? Who likes me? And what am I going to do after graduation? What am I going to do for a job? I know my son, he's facing that right now. Um, been out of school for two months. Uh, we've, we've made him do his math. And those things that we know are going to be important are some of the things that he's not having to do, but some of the important questions for our high schoolers. We have seniors that are going to graduate this year, and to them, the most important question might be, what am I doing after graduation? Or maybe as an adult, the most important question that you might have is, where am I going to get a job? How am I going to provide for my family? But tonight, I want to talk about the truly most important question that any of us can ask, and that question is, who is Jesus? You know, today we've been celebrating Resurrection Sunday, and um, we've been celebrating a man named Jesus who is raised from the dead. And in, in Christendom, we, we talk about Jesus Christ and how he came and he walked and he lived and he died and resurrected again on the third day. And he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that's the whole point of today is that we celebrated a risen Savior. But who is Jesus? I want to look real quick at four worldviews of who Jesus is. These are some of the worldviews that our society or the world looks at and says who they think Jesus is. And the first is this, that he's a fictional character. That Jesus is just somebody that Christians made up. They just made him up uh, just trying to scare people to do right or whatever they may be thinking, but it's a fictional character. There are people in our society today that when you name the name Jesus, they don't even know that you're talking about the Son of God. And so to them, it's a fictional character. They think, well, it's just, we're here, the earth has been here for billions of years, and, and one day we'll just take our last breath and it'll all be done. And so they think that Jesus is a fictional character. The second uh, worldly view of who Jesus is is that he was a historical figure. They admit that, yes, Jesus was alive. He is a man. I mean, we have uh, proof. We have books other than the Bible that talk about a man named Jesus who lived in Bethlehem and, was, and had a ministry. And some people teach that he's just a historical figure. And they have the falsehood that, again, he isn't the Son of God who we as Christians proclaim that he is but that he's just a historical figure like any other important historical figure that we might talk about in history. And the third is that he was a religious leader or a prophet. They actually will say that, yes, that in society or in, world to, in our world today, they say that he was a religious leader. He was a prophet. Even the religion of Islam admits that Jesus was a good man and that Jesus was a prophet. That he was a religious teacher. But they do not accept the fact that he is the son of God. And so our worldview is, is that, hey, he's just another religious leader like Buddha or Muhammad or uh, Hare Krishna or any of these other religious figures that we have out there today. They distinguish no difference between who Jesus is. And the fourth is that, well, he was a good moral example. That Jesus was maybe all of these things above, but, and he just really was a good moral 
example that we as Christians have made up and said, hey, this is a moral example of who we should live our lives after. And so tonight, I just want to encourage you, ask yourself, who is Jesus? I mean, really ask yourself, who is Jesus? Do you have the right view of who Jesus is? Do you really believe that Jesus is who he said he was? And the best way for me to show you or to tell you who Jesus is, who the real Jesus is, is for me to go to the Word of God. And so tonight I want to ask you to turn to John chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I want to share a story with you. I have a picture. I think it's up on the screen now. Um, I want us to look at this picture. There was a lady in 2012. She was a self-proclaimed artist. She was self-proclaimed. She was an artist, and they had uh, a museum, had a portrait of this man called Jesus. He is on the left side. The actual portrait, you see, is on the left side of the screen, and the picture was becoming faded. It was becoming um, just where you couldn't really tell what it was. And so she contacts this museum, and she says, hey, I'm an artist. I can restore that image for you. I can restore that to the way it was when in, before and make it back to where it looks like it's a brand new painting. And so the, the museum agreed and they said, okay, we'll let you take that painting and you recreate that painting or you refurbish or whatever you call it in art where they take and they redo a masterpiece. And if you, when you look at the screen up here, you'll see when she contacted the museum and said, hey, I'm done, her picture is on the right. Now, does that look anything like the picture before? You can't even tell if it's a man, a woman, who it is. But this woman, and this was in 2012, she told this museum that she could recreate this masterpiece. And a lot of times in our life, we have a skewed view of who Jesus really is. Like these worldly views that we looked at here just a few minutes ago, Maybe our view is not really what the Scripture says it is. Maybe we believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Maybe we believe that He did all of the miracles that we see in Scripture. But our view of Him is skewed. We really don't fully understand who Jesus is. And I want to read the first five verses of John 14. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time in John 14:6. But in John 14, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And here in, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he has been teaching for right at three years now. He's coming to the end of his ministry. He has done numerous miracles. He's fed 5,000 people. He's walked on water. He has healed the blind. He has healed the lame. He has even brought people back from the dead. And yet now we see in this story that if, if you continue and read through John 14, the people are worried. They're scared. And Jesus is trying to calm them down. He's trying to let them know who he is. And he's trying to say, hey, don't worry. Don't be troubled. Look, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And just imagine, Jesus was on this earth for roughly 33 years. He has been gone for roughly 2,020 years now, imagine the place he is preparing for us. How awesome is that going to be? But Jesus was trying to explain to him, and here's Thomas, one of his disciples that really didn't have a clear view of who Jesus was. I mean, Thomas had walked hand in hand with Jesus. He, he was there when the miracles happened. He was there when the dead was raised. He was there when he fed more than 5,000 people. You know, Scripture says 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So we can easily say, in a good estimate, would be upwards of 10,000 plus people Jesus fed with just a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread. 
Thomas was there. And so Jesus gives this statement and he says, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Thomas says, well, we don't know where you're going. And how do we know the way? Here's a man that walked hand in hand. But yet his view of who Jesus was, he had not fully understood that Jesus was the Son of God. That he was the Messiah. He was our Savior. Jesus is the one that we are celebrating today. That he has risen, excuse me, that he has risen from the dead. And so Jesus goes on and he gives an explanation to Thomas. And this is one of my favorite verses that I share with our youth on Wednesday nights. John 14, 6, Jesus said this. It says, and then he said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. And so Jesus is laying out and he gives us three different distinct ways of who he is. And this is what I want to leave you with tonight is that this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the way. He is the only way. Jesus is the only way that we can get to heaven. The world will tell you, as we saw in those other worldly views, that you know, they didn't give a right view of who Jesus was. But when we look at this verse, Jesus is very specific. And we see in this verse, that is a very strong, impossible statement to fake. And I think it was C.S. Lewis that made a statement one time. He said, Jesus is either who he said he was, or he's a raving lunatic. It's one or the other. And I'm thankful that Jesus is who he said he was. And so Jesus says that I am the way. He is the only way that we can get to heaven. It is only through his shed blood. It is only because he was resurrected on this day that we celebrate today. That is who he is. He is the way. And it's only through him and his shed blood that we can enter into the kingdom of God. And then he makes the next statement. He says, I am the truth. Jesus was the absolute truth. A lot of times our society and our world doesn't want to admit that there's an absolute truth because if you admit that there's an absolute truth, that means that there's an absolute wrong. And a lot of people don't want to be told that they're wrong. I know in my life sometimes when my wife corrects me, I hate that she points out the fact that I'm wrong. And uh, it, it just doesn't feel good. I mean, I don't like to be told I'm wrong, but we have to know there is a truth, and it is an absolute truth, and that is Jesus. He is the truth. And it was through his teaching and his ministry, and it was through his sacrifice that we have the way to get to heaven. And so Jesus has the truth. Everything that he spoke, everything that he taught was the truth. There has not ever been a time that anybody has ever been able to prove that Jesus' teachings were false. The Pharisees tried to trip him up. The Sadducees, the scribes, all your religious leaders in that time, they tried to trap Jesus, but they never could because Jesus is the truth. And then the third and final thing that I want to look at tonight is that Jesus, he says that he is the way and that he is the truth and that he is the life. He's the way that we get to God the Father. He is the truth by which we study and we learn and we strive after. And He is the life. He is the everlasting life that each of us should desire. He gives us that eternal life. Again, it is through His sacrifice. It is through His death that we celebrated just this last Friday. And then he was buried and was resurrected on the third day. And it is through his life and his sacrifice that we have a way to our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus, he tells the crowd and he's, and he's responding to Thomas, but yet he's teaching the crowd and he's letting them know. And he says, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, nobody. Not one single person on the face of this earth can come to the Father except through me. And Jesus was very clear. He was the only way. There is no other way that we can get to heaven. And so tonight I hope that you have a clear view of who Jesus is 
And one other thing on this, on uh, that Jesus is the life, you know, the reality in life is that we sometimes settle for much less than what God has to offer. You know, in this life, sometimes we don't live the life that God has for us. It's sort of like I have a snack-sized candy bar, but yet God has a full-size buffet set out for me. And I'm happy and content with that little candy bar, that little snack-sized candy bar. C.S. Lewis, again, I'll quote him here, and, and this is a very uh, just in-your-face statement, but C.S. Lewis once said, he said, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud piles in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And so in this life that Jesus talks about, in this life that Jesus offers each and every one of us, each and every one of mankind, he died for everybody. This, this holiday, or, and I hate to say holiday, but this holy day that we celebrate as Christians was meant for everybody. When Jesus died on the cross and when he was resurrected, he was resurrected and he paid the price for every single person on the face of the earth. The only question is, will you accept that free gift? He died and paid the price for everyone. And what's required of us is to repent, to say that we're sorry, to ask forgiveness for our sins, to acknowledge that we are sinners, and then to trust in Jesus and Him alone for salvation. And it is when we do that, when we repent of our sins and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone, we have salvation and we are co-heirs with Christ to the kingdom of God. And this is who Jesus is really is and so tonight i just want to challenge you if you've never repented of your sins and trusted in jesus why not today resurrection sunday make that right with god what an awesome way to end resurrection sunday by surrendering your life to the one that paid for your sins let's pray father god i do thank you lord i thank you that tonight we are ending a day, a weekend, to where we celebrate and we remember the sacrifice that you made for us. God, that you knew all along that we were a broken people. And Father, you knew that we needed a way to have a relationship with you. And Lord, you were willing to send your one and only Son to come to live on this earth, to be mocked, to be beaten, to be crucified, and to die and pay the price for our sins. But Lord, I am so thankful that today I get to celebrate the fact that I have a risen Savior, that that tomb is empty, that He is at your right hand interceding on my behalf right now. And Lord, I pray that if there's one in the sound of my voice that is not repented and trusted in you as their Lord and Savior, that tonight, God, that tonight you would lay a conviction upon their heart so great that, Father, they would finally surrender their life to you. Lord, that they would repent of their sins and trust in you. And, Lord, that they would be able to have that free gift of salvation that we celebrate today. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.